Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde der Akademieprogramme des Jüdischen Museums Berlin, uh, dear Rabbi Dr. Goshen Gottstein, uh, dear Dr. Shah Kazemi, it's so wonderful that you can be here and I welcome everybody to the Academy uh, of the Jewish Museum Berlin. Mein Name ist Sini Rosbach, ich bin Kommissar kommissarische Leiterin der Akademieprogramme der Michael Blumenthal Akademie des Jüdischen Museums Berlin. Ich begrüße Sie sehr herzlich zu unserer heutigen Veranstaltung zum Thema Mono oder Poly, Judentum, Islam und Hinduismus. Es ist der zweite Abend der jüdisch-muslimischen Ringvorlesung mit dem Titel Der Glaube der Anderen, Weltreligionen im Spiegel von Judentum und Islam, die von unserem jüdisch-islamischen Forum organisiert wird. In unserer ersten Veranstaltung im November ging es um das wechselseitige Verhältnis und um das Bild, das Judentum und Islam über die Jahrhunderte hinweg voneinander hatten. Die heutige Veranstaltung widmet sich der jüdischen und der muslimischen Sicht auf den Hinduismus bzw. auf die verschiedenen hinduistischen Religionen, die in Indien beheimatet sind. Mit dem Hinduismus assoziieren wir vor allem eine Vielzahl von Gottesbildern, Gottheiten und ihren Manifestationen. Auf den ersten Blick ist der Hinduismus daher die polytheistische Religion par excellence. Für Judentum und Islam gehört dagegen der Glaube an den einen Gott und damit an die Einheit der Transzendenz zur, zur zentralen Glaubensvorstellung. Wie betrachten diese beiden Religionen, die hinduistischen Traditionen, Glaubenslehren und die Götterwelt, die den eigenen Vorstellungen als so gegensätzlich erscheinen? Wie könnte ein Weg der gegenseitigen Wertschätzung und Achtung für diese Jahrtausende alten Religionssysteme aussehen? Es ist uns eine große Freude, für den heutigen Abend zwei ausgewiesene Experten begrüßen zu dürfen. Rabbiner Dr. Alon goschen gottstein und Dr. Reza Shah-Kazemi. Welcome to both of you. Professor Mohamed Soheli Umar, der angekündigt war als Referent für den Abend heute Abend, ist leider aus logistischen Gründen verhindert und äh, konnte nicht kommen. Und wir freuen uns umso mehr, dass mit Herrn Dr. Shah Kazemi aus äh, London ein ebenfalls exzellenter Fachmann sehr kurzfristig zugesagt hat und innerhalb von vier Tagen um, hier die Reise nach Berlin möglich gemacht hat. Uh, thank you again for making it possible to come at such a very short notice. Ähm, lassen Sie mich nun unseren ersten Referenten, äh, Rabbiner Dr. Alon goschen gottstein vorstellen. Er ist ausgewiesener Experte für interreligiöse Beziehungen. Er ist Judaist und Gründer des Elijah Interfaith Institute, welches Vertreter und Geistlicher verschiedener Religionen zu Studium und Dialog zusammenbringt. Er studierte Talmud, jüdisches Denken und Religionswissenschaft in Jerusalem und in Harvard. Die spirituelle Ausbildung umfasste Beziehungen zu nichtjüdischen spirituellen Meistern und Gemeinschaften, zum Beispiel zu christlichen Mönch Mönchsgemeinschaften, aber auch zu hinduistischen und muslimischen Lehren. Er ist mit einigen chassidischen Gemeinschaften ebenfalls verbunden. Seit vielen Jahren verbringt er jährlich mehrere Wochen in Indien, unter anderem in Sivananda Ashram. Diese Erfahrungen mit der indischen Spiritualität verarbeitete er in zwei Büchern, die uns auch sogleich in das Thema des Abends einführen. Sie haben den Titel The Jewish Encounter with Hinduism, Wisdom, Spirituality, Identity und ein weiteres Buch mit dem Titel Same God, Other God, Judaism, Hinduism and the Problem of Idolatry. Was den Verlauf diesen Abends, äh, dieses Abends betrifft, so werden die beiden Referenten nach ihren Vorträgen die Gelegenheit erhalten, miteinander zu diskutieren, bevor wir auch mit Ihnen, mit dem Publikum, äh, die Möglichkeit geben, Fragen zu stellen und mitzudiskutieren. Die Vorträge werden diesmal etwas länger sein als üblich. Die beiden Referenten werden jeweils etwa 40 Minuten sprechen. Bevor ich das Wort an die beiden Gäste übergebe, möchte ich Sie noch darauf hinweisen, dass die heutige Veranstaltung auf Englisch stattfindet und Sie an der Seite, falls Sie es noch nicht getan haben, sich Kopfhörer äh, für die deutsche Übersetzung ähm, nehmen können. Unsere Übersetzerin heute Abend ähm, in der Kabine sind Frau Astrid Gese und äh, Frau Güder Toro. Und vielen Dank auch Ihnen. Ähm, ein letzter Dank geht an Sophia Nowak, äh, die, äh, die das jüdisch-islamische Forum verantwortet in der Akademie, äh, in den Akademieprogrammen des Jüdischen Museums Berlin, sowohl von der Veranstaltungsabteilung Antje Grötsch und Judith Klein, ähm, die die Logistik und den Ablauf heute Abend koordiniert haben. Um, so, with that, I would like to ask Dr. Alan Goschen-Gottschein 
to the podium. Thank you. By way of show and tell, so these are the images of the two books. And we're going to have a public auction at the end of my lecture. And whoever pays the highest price gets to go home with a copy. It's very special for me to be here in Berlin. Um, my family roots are from Berlin. I was walking today with my son, Alicia, who I can't see because I'm totally blinded by these lights. Uh, I was walking with him in Unter den Linden, telling him that Walter Silberstein, uh, my great-grandfather, had a clothing store where he used to uh, dress all the nobility of late 19th century in this town. Uh, and my father had his bar mitzvah, and right, I believe right after Kristallnacht, uh, moved to Israel. And coming to Berlin is in some way also a way of uh, retrieving memory within our, within our, within our family. So it's, it's a very special opportunity for me to be discussing something that on the one hand is spiritual, intellectual, but in many ways also contemporary and political, and bringing it all together. Uh, in this talk. So my talk is about the challenges, uh, the description and the challenges of a Jewish view of Hinduism. And I see that some of the defining of the question is already up on the board from the perspective of monotheism and polytheism, uh, which uh, Sophia, uh, to whom I'm extremely grateful for the ongoing dialogue that has preceded this meeting over several months, uh, has been ably responsible. Let me begin with a few words by way of introducing the history of the relationship, providing context for it, and then from that context, we can move on to some of the more challenging uh, philosophical, theological, and contemporary issues. How old is the Jewish-Hindu relationship? Well, we don't exactly know, but in some ways, it dates all the way back to King Solomon's time. Uh, the self-identity of some of the Hindu Jewish communities in India claims contacts are that far back. We already have various loan uh, uh words that came from uh, Indian languages already in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, uh, these have been uh, uh, documented. So clearly there was contact at a very uh, early point. And either during first temple times or after the temple exile or second temple times, there are different, different dates. But the point really is that it's a very old community. One of the things that characterizes that relationship, it's not only its antiquity, but also how peaceful it is. India is one of the few countries worldwide where Jews were never persecuted. There's one small exception to that, which is when the Portuguese ruled Goa, then indeed uh, under, under uh, Christian influence, Jews were persecuted. But in terms of the indigenous population, the relationships have always been harmonious and is something that the uh, Indian rulers uh, and the Hindu community take, take great uh, pride in. The Jewish community in India was never a major center. You judge a major Jewish center by learning, by intellectual, spiritual creativity. We don't have a single significant work of halakha, Jewish law, Jewish philosophy, uh, or any other form that's typical of classical Jewish creativity as distinct, for instance, from modern literature or modern painting that we do. But we don't have any classical form of uh, Jewish creativity to emerge out of the lives of Jews in India. What that means is that we're dealing with a very small, a very marginal community, and one that is detached from the major centers. This community is well received, and in many ways also undergoes acculturation. By acculturation, I mean the fact that there are practices and customs that are typical of the broader Indian context that shape Jewish life. One of the most noteworthy of these is the penetration of the caste system. As you know, in uh, uh, India, or rather Hinduism, is built on a graded societal system with, with a kind of inbuilt hierarchy. Uh, and some of that has penetrated into the Jewish community itself that also starts to have its own sub-caste divisions that then play out into the rituals. We have a fundamentally Jewish community, Jewish practice, Jewish liturgy, with superimposition of various rituals and practices that grow out of the particular context. What's important for present purposes is the question of what can we learn from the Jews of India regarding a view of Hinduism? After all, 
who would be a better voice to represent a Jewish view of Hinduism than Jews who have lived there, right? You would think that. And the fact is that we have next to nothing, which is nothing, of a Jewish view of Hinduism from Jewish Indian sources. Uh, I at least have been unable, and I've turned to various experts, and I've turned to people in the community asking them, tell me how they viewed them. Did they view them as idolaters, as brothers? What can we learn? Apparently the community was so well integrated and so small that the concerns of what today is the defining issue, namely the question of idolatry with relationship to Hinduism, does not feature at all in any of the memory or the writings of the Jews of India. Quite distinct from what Reza is going to be presenting with you uh, in his presentation, the Jews offer no, no real testimony to that. We do have in the Geniza, the Geniza is a, is a, a treasure of Jewish sources that were kept in a synagogue in Cairo. We have testimonies of Jews uh, in the Middle Ages who serve as sailors who refer to their Indian co-sailors as brothers who worship the same God. So you have some kind of a testimony of a sense of a common God that cuts across religious difference even between Jews and Hindus in a, in a mercantile context, which of course is a very interesting and significant testimony. In other words, the Jews did not feel we have nothing in common with them, we avoid them, we keep distance. Rather, there is a sense of commonality, but that's almost as far as, far as we go. Things change radically in the 20th century. Uh, 20th century, you have a situation of India coming to the West and Jews coming to India. This has several waves, but with the export of the gurus, beginning at the end of the 19th century, it's typically the advent is dated with the coming of Swami Vivekananda uh, uh, to the Parliament of Religions in 1893 in Chicago. Uh, and then uh, uh, wave after wave uh, with Yogananda and then more recent gurus up to this very day uh, with India exporting its spirituality to the West. And Jews reciprocally going to visit uh, 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 the East, you have wave after wave of Jews who, who, who visit India, and Jews are associated with some of the most important Hindu religious figures, as I will detail later on in my presentation. The phenomenon receives an extra boost in the 90s when Israel and India sign uh, peace, uh, sign diplomatic relations, as a consequence of which travel is opened up to Israelis, and it becomes almost de rigueur for Israelis following their army service to go on a world trip and where previously South America was the preferred destination. India is the destination of choice. Of course, not all Israelis. Israelis may go after army service to many places, but there definitely is a, a very distinct cat cultural pattern of traveling to what is called the Hummus Trail. Uh, the Hummus Trail is a set of destinations inside, inside uh, India where Israelis go, and most of them do not depart from the Hummus Trail. They go from one destination after the other, but it covers some significant and some uh, important sites in India, and it leads to a lot of exposure to Indian culture. There are many reasons for that. Some of you may have followed even uh, recently uh, uh, on the international scene uh, the great achievement, you can decide if you want to put quotation marks next to it or not, of uh, our prime minister returning home in a plane with a young Israeli woman who was, who, who was released from a, a Russian uh, jail after a seven and a half year sentence for carrying nine grams of hashish. How many people here have followed that story? Uh, a, few, a few people have followed that story. Well, basically that was part of the Israeli experience in India, availability of drugs, cheap drugs. That's part of the Israeli experience. The other side of it is, of course, the higher aspects of of spirituality and what Israelis find there. And sociologists have studied that and they definitely have, are able to profile according to the age group what it is that draws people. Is it the cheap food, hanging out, getting over the stress of the army, uh, seeking identity, seeking spirituality, forming long-term relationships? There's a full gamut. So Jews internationally, Jews from Israel exposed to a, con a context with uh, uh, with India. So really, the relationship is on the whole minor, but it's gaining increasing prominence uh, on the Jewish side. And I would say that one of the characteristics of the relationship is that it's largely one-sided. Uh, we do not see, we do not see hundreds of thousands or should be proportionately millions 
of Hindus coming to visit Israel. We do not see a quest of Hindus to integrate Judaism into their worldview. We do not see an attempt to look for what message Judaism might have to bring to India. In other words, most of the interest is one-sided. And this is indeed one of the issues, challenges, and problems that exists in the present uh, Hindu-Jewish relationship is, it, is its one-sidedness. The political reality and the military reality create more of a reciprocity in the relationship, but from the spiritual perspective, uh, this is one of the elements that we'd want to point out to. Now, let's now look at the question, moving against this brief background, to the very question of legitimacy. Now, legitimacy, I think, is the key issue. Uh, Underlying the way the problem is placed here, mono or poly, uh, the, um, is a fundamental question, is it a legitimate religion? And one of the things I can already tell you, it will be interesting to see how Reza, from a Muslim perspective, and I, from a Jewish perspective, conceptualize what are the foundations of legitimacy. Our two traditions have very different ways of establishing what affords legitimacy to another religious tradition. So what is it that makes another religion, another religion valid? Well, here, from a Jewish perspective, we have two basic criteria. The one is largely a moral one, though it's moral slash revelational. There's a notion in, in Jewish tradition known as the seven Noahide commandments. The seven Noahide commandments are fundamental moral precepts. You don't kill, you don't steal, you don't have adultery, you don't blaspheme God, you don't worship idols, you have a moral society. And they're taken to be a parallel or even an antecedent revelation to the revelation that Jews received at Sinai that are given to all of humanity in order to have a basic moral society. So that's one criterion of viewing other religions. Are these religions seven... Noahide laws compliant? Are they compliant with the seven Noahide laws? And, and this is one conversation. The second conversation, which is strictly speaking a subset of that, but in fact becomes the larger conversation, is the question of idolatry, a religion that is free of idolatry. And of course, what is idolatry is the problem. Idolatry can be the notion of many gods. Idolatry can be the worship of objects, of, of statues. Uh, and idolatry can be just the sense of otherness. So this particular book, still in plastic, uh, is called Same God, Other God, Judaism, Hinduism, and the Problem of Idolatry. And it seeks to explore, particularly with the problem of idolatry, how do Jews, how do Jews engage this particular question of idolatry? And I can give you a sneak preview that the next session in this series will feature my very good friend, uh, Professor Yehuda Gelman, who's going to be talking about similar issues from the perspective of Buddhism. Again, what defines idolatry in another religion? What does Judaism have to do in order to recognize the legitimacy of another religion as ostensibly non-idolatrous? So the issue of, uh, um, of idolatry as I said earlier, does not really have, uh, for the translators, I'm skipping the part on wisdom, so just skip a few lines in the, in the outline. The, 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 issue of, the issue of idolatry does not have a lot of precedent in the, uh, in the Jewish view of, wisdom, of, of Hinduism because there simply has not been a history of exploring this issue. As I said earlier, the Jewish communities did not put this question forth. So this issue really starts to come to the forth in a focused way. There are re passing references in the responsa literature. These are questions that people asked rabbis how to rule in a given situation. You can see already from the 18th century a default assumption uh, in the legal literature that Hinduism is idolatrous. But a sustained discussion of that we don't really get until, until the 20th century. And most of the discussions on the status of Hinduism are derived from an extension of a Jewish view of Christianity. That is to say, there's a Jewish view of Christianity. And then you have to say, what are the guiding principles that were articulated in relationship to Christianity? And then you extend the principles of the attitude to Christianity. You extend them to a discussion of Hinduism. And I'm going to share two of those strategies with you now. So in fact, there are several fundamental approaches. And with regard to Christianity. One approach considers Christianity to be idolatrous, and this is a, a, a perspective 
that is classically identified with the figure of Moses Maimonides, who, of all the halachists, the legal legal rulers, is the one who, who was most clear and unequivocal about the idolatrous, or avodah zarah, if you will, to, to, there's some slight difference, but we're not going to go into that, uh, status of, of Christianity. What makes it? Well, perhaps the Trinity, perhaps the worship of, of, of Jesus as a human being, perhaps the use of images in worship. He doesn't actually explain why Christianity is idolatrous, perhaps the incarnation. Uh, thank God, there's lots of different ways of tackling the subject, so it makes for a lot of interesting conversation. In what way and why is Christianity idolatrous? And that question, that conversation, then extends further into the situation of Hinduism. Now, let me illustrate that default position. And I will illustrate that with events that occurred in 2004, which means that everybody in this room still remembers them. You may not know this event, but all, of, all your memories stretch back to 2004, so it's not that long ago. Um, so in Hindu temples, especially in South India, there is an act that's called tonsuring. Tonsuring is when you shave the head and make an offering of the hair uh, to the temple, to the god. It's done as a vow of, uh, of self-abnegation or a vow of gratitude. or it's, it's a way to offer something, and it's relatively easy to, to offer hair because uh, you know, no lives were lost in the offering of this hair. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, as, as everyone knows, Indian women have beautiful hair, and it's taken care of with coconut oil, so therefore it's a very, very, very high-grade or very high-grade hair. It's one of the important features of a, uh, Indian femininity, so to speak. And uh, it's offered. The temple trustees collect it. Uh, they have huge storehouses of hair. What do you do? You sell. What do you sell it for? You sell it for wigs. Who uses wigs? Orthodox Jewish women. So Orthodox Jewish women are using wigs that were offered in Hindu temples. Now you are not allowed to use anything that was offered as idolatry. There's a notion in Hebrew called tikrovet avodazara, in other words, an offer made to another god, and an offer made to another god is, is seen as something very serious. It's so serious that you mustn't benefit from it. In other words, even a tikrovet avodazara, something offered to, to an idol, can't even be sold or given as a gift because you can derive no benefit from it. There's only one solution, burn them. In order to burn them, you gotta go to a bonfire. So the question came up in 2004, what's the status of these wigs? Well, actually, the question had come up earlier. In earlier decisions, they ruled that they were permissible. But this is the power of Jewish creativity. Yesterday's answer isn't necessarily good enough, and they sort of come up with new, uh, uh, with new views and new perspectives. And in 2004, uh, the figurehead of Jewish ultra-Orthodoxy, Rabbi El Yashiv, uh, of blessed memory ruled that they were indeed tikrovet avodazara, an offering made to an idol. So what do you got to do? You got to burn them. How do you burn in a bonfire? Where do you do the bonfire in open space? Who comes? Photographers from the New York Times. So photographers from the New York Times come and take pictures of Jews in Brooklyn burning Hindu wigs. You can imagine this was a great public relation achievement for Jews in relation to Hindus. Hindus took great offense. What is this thing that you're burning our wigs? And what is, the, what, what is this saying about us? I remember being in Alaska, uh, and at that time, where else would you be when they burn wigs in New York? Uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and the Chabad rabbi there saying what a disaster it was for him because there he is having to defend a position he doesn't believe in. Uh, incidentally, his rabbi, the Lubavitcher rabbi, never partook, never partook of that ban. And the interesting argument was put forth that he had the Holy Spirit. And as you know, every Sunday he would give dollars to men and women who passed by him and uh, as a way of connecting with them, giving them charity. Well, he goes and all these women are wearing wigs, which, because in Chabad they don't cover their hair with a piece of cloth, they cover it with wigs. So Chabad women are wearing wigs coming from Temple Hill. Now, don't tell me that someone of his high level, the Holy Spirit, didn't sense that it was idolatry, so it runs the argument. So obviously it was an idolatry, and therefore the Chabad people are, are, against, are against this move. So you can see this whole conversation going on, but it all around the, the premise that Hinduism is idolatrous. So this became a major issue, uh, and one that upset many Hindu people, and then led to various attempts to, to be addressed. And the issue hasn't died, because one of the things about 
Judaism is eternal religion. Nothing ever dies in Judaism. And therefore, any problem that's there, even when it gets solved, it comes up again. So nowadays we've got Hindu Wigs point two and Hindu Wigs point three. And the issue keeps coming up periodically, though the first, the first cycle, of course, was the, was the biggest and most violent. But there are ongoing discussions in the ultra-Orthodox community, Hindu Wigs, uh, Indian rather, well, in, in, Indian Wigs derived from offerings in Hindu temple. Are they offerings? Are they not? Are they technically offerings or not? The interesting thing is no one's asking the question, is Hinduism idolatrous? They all take it for granted that it is, and the discussion is, is this considered technically an offering or not? But there isn't a discussion of whether it is idolatrous or not. So this is one particular uh, public expression of it. At the same time, and a little bit in uh, as a consequence of it, a second movement starts to occur. Second movement starts and this is also part of the improvement of Jewish-Indian-Hindu relations, uh, you know what the best thing to unite different religions is? A common enemy, right? So uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't even think I was telling a joke there. So, um, the, but that is the, that is the situation. You have a common enemy, you have a common challenge. As religions unite. There's a friend of mine sitting in this hall. Uh, he's got a mission to unite the different religions to help climate change, right? So climate change is a common enemy. You've got to unite to fight this common enemy, this common challenge. So what's the common enemy for Jews and Hindus? Guess? Yeah, you could say Islam, but it's not really Islam per se. It's missionaries. And missionaries is primarily Christian missionaries. So the Hindus feel, because Hinduism is very tolerant and very accepting, and here we are allowing them to steal our people, there comes a point where in terms of identity, we need to protect our identity and we have to stop missionary work. Well, we need uh, allies in that, right? So who can one billion Hindus turn to as allies? The answer is very simple, eight million Jews. So the Hindu leadership has a summit with the chief rabbinate and ra of Israel and rabbis of other countries to discuss the common challenge of missionary. And from a typology of religions perspective, you know, religions can divide into missionary and non-missionary. It's one way of, of, of dividing them. And one of the things that Judaism and Hinduism really have in common is they're both non-missionary religions. And then they begot these very active missionary religions, right? Judaism begot Christianity and Islam. Uh, Reza may take exception to that historical description. That's it will be his prerogative. And Hindu, uh, Hinduism begets uh, Buddhism. So, so the non-missionary religion begets a different form of religion that's then very missionary, then carries part of that message or some transformed part of it into other religions. But the, the, these two mother religions, which are foundational to the respective cultures of East and West, are in of themselves non-missionary. So non-missionary Hindus turn to non-missionary Jews and say, let's make an alliance to find missionaries which shows how important that is. It also shows how big Israel is in the Indian mind. In other words, it's not a function of geographic size or demographic size, but there's a sense of power, significance, place in the world, voice in the world, that Hindu leaders would want to come to collaborate with Jewish leaders on this issue of mission. So Hindu, Hindu leaders and Jewish leaders are sitting at the table, first at 2007 in Delhi, and then 2008 in Jerusalem. There, the, real, the real goal of these summits is to deal with missionaries, but Jews got to have a common foundation for dealing with, with, with uh, 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 Hindus. What, what, what am I to do with you? We're not doing the same kind of thing. So one of the most, if you read the transcripts, and believe it or not, I have, uh, you see that one of the main issues that come up in those conversations is the status of Hinduism as idolatry. So one religion, religious leader after another tries to explain, no, we don't worship different idols. It's all manifestations of one being. And they start to put forth a philosophy of unity that blows the mind of the rabbis away. And you can see this. We had no idea of this. We always thought you were polytheists, and now you're telling us that really you believe in one God. Now, there's nuances we could get to. Are you monists? In other words, you believe in one being. Or are you monotheists that believe in one God? And is it the one being that manifests in all its different forms? But underlying it all, there's a sense of unity. The kind of sense of unity uh, that allows, allows the Jews to change their perception of Hinduism as idolatry. So I'm going to explain those mechanisms in just a minute, but I want to read to you a couple of paragraphs from the uh, declarations. Uh, both the 2007 and the 2008 summit uh, yielded declarations 
of the uh, of the two uh, of the two summits, and those declarations both reference the problem of of uh, of Hinduism as idolatry. And I'm just going to read to you a few uh, two, two two paragraphs, and then I'll explain to you how that could be possible theoretically, and what are the mechanisms by means of which Jews exonerate a religion from a charge of idolatry, or in other words, affirm its legitimacy. So it says here, um, so the first declaration says the following. It describes the two religions. It says, their respective traditions teach faith in one supreme being, who is the ultimate reality, who has created this world in its blessed diversity, and who has communicated divine ways of action for humanity for different peoples in different times and places. Okay? Their respective traditions teach faith in one supreme being. That sounds to me pretty nicely, pretty nicely uh, 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 monogamous? No, wrong word. Uh, monotonous? No. What, what, uh, monotheistic, thank you. Uh, th so this, is, this, this sounds nicely monotheistic, or at least vague enough that Jews, the Jews and Hindus can agree on a common definition. The respect of Jesus, faith in one supreme being who is the ultimate reality. Now, of course, these languages are chosen by the Hindus, and they mean one thing to the Hindus, they mean something else to the Jews. But it's, it's certainly uh, 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 an important step forward. And let me read to you the, the, formation, the formulation of the second declaration. Okay? Uh, in keeping with the de this, this is from the second declaration. In keeping with the Delhi Declaration, the participants reaffirmed their commitment to deepening bilateral relationship, predicated, in other words, this is a condition, on the recognition of one supreme being, creator, and guide of the cosmos. Then it goes to say, it is recognized that the one supreme being, both in its formless and manifest aspects, has been worshipped by Hindus over the millennia. This does not mean that Hindus worship, quotation mark, gods, in quotation mark, and idols. The Hindu relates only to the one supreme being when he, she prays to a particular manifestation. So the, the, someone has their headset on loud enough that I hear it and it's distracting my thinking. So whoever you are whose headset is reaching me, try to tone it down or put it in your ear because I'm, I'm, I'm getting distracted by someone's headset being too loud. So. So this, this one supreme being uh, has a formless and manifest aspect. Now this is not, the, you can't say this in Hebrew. There's no, there's no way to make that statement in Hebrew a formless and manifest aspect. You, you, you simply can't say this in Hebrew. This is a Hindu terminology. And rabbis are signing on to a statement made by Hindus that really puts forth what is known here probably technically as Advaita philosophy, and Reza is going to talk about that later, of a formless and manifest aspect. And that's what the Hindus are worshipping. And contrary to the testimony of much of really what goes in Hindu religion, Hindus do not worship gods and idols. They only relate to the one supreme being. In other words, this is one of the things that interreligious dialogue does. You very often end up changing who you are and what you believe, or at least how you present it when you have to present yourself to the other. So when the, when the Hindus are sitting in a conversation with the Jews and they have to describe and affirm their, their, their religious view, they are doing so in terms that the Jews will be comfortable with, even at the cost of twisting or slightly distorting the historical and even the theological truth of their tradition. It's true, but it's pushing the truth a little bit. But the point is, that the Hindus walked away from that meeting thinking they had resolved the question of idolatry. In other words, Swami Dayananda, who was the founder of this particular movement, made the statement, that's it, the subject of idolatry is now off the table. It's not so simple, it's not off the table, but a big step has been taken forward. So what are the strategies by means of which, strategies that were originally developed with relationship to Christianity, by means of which the rabbis could have affirmed this? And here, two stra I want to share two key strategies in relationship to a Jewish view of other religions that, have been, that can be and that have been applied in relationship to Hinduism. So the one strategy is the notion of shituf. Shituf is worshiping another being alongside God. And underlying the strategy is the recognition 
that monotheism is not, shall we say, a zero-sum game. It's not you either are monotheist or not, but rather there's shades of monotheism. And what applies, according to Maimonides, same criteria apply to Jews and non-Jews. According to the view of the legal authorities who are called the Tosafists, those who wrote the glosses on the Talmud known as the Tosafot, according to their view, there are different degrees, different standards of monotheism. There's one standard of monotheism that applies to Jews. There's another standard of monotheism that applies to non-Jews. It's a softer kind of monotheism. So Jews have the requirement to worship God and God alone and to not worship any other being alongside God. Non-Jews, it's enough that they recognize God. If they recognize God, they can also worship another being alongside God. So that recognition is the basis for a very common view of Christianity as non-idolatrous because non-Jews don't have the same standards. So Christians can worship God and they can worship Jesus and Jews will consider Jesus for this purpose to be human, not God incarnate because Jews don't recognize the possibility of incarnation. So they're worshiping God and they're worshiping a human being and it doesn't matter because the standards expected of non-Jews are different. So there's no danger to Jewish identity because we have our standards and there's no problem of enmity or religious tension because we recognize the other religion. It's a very neat strategy. This strategy was the strategy that really for, uh, beginning from Moses Mendelssohn, just to mention a great personality of this, uh, of this city, uh, from that point onwards, more or less time-wise, Yaakov Emden is another important figure of that time. Around that period and basically down to uh, mid 20th century was the predominant view of Ashkenazi Jews regarding Christianity. Christianity is not idolatrous because non-Jews don't have the same standard when it comes to when it comes to the strictness of monotheism. So that's one standard. And then you apply it. The first chief rabbi of the state of Israel, Rabbi Herzog, raised the possibility that Hindus too would apply that category, and therefore they are not monothe and therefore not idolatrous. There's another strategy that, to me, is even more important and even more consistent, and that's attributed to a uh, 14th century a figure, Menachem Hameiri, from Montpellier, who basically stands the argument on its head and says, if they have a moral life and they believe in a God who governs a moral system and it's a moral society, then it's God. We know it's God by the fruits, and the fruits are a moral ordered society. And therefore, any religion that teaches morality is a sign of the God. And that, from that point onward, we don't care what they teach and we don't care what their practices are, as long as they're fundamentally moral and they fundamentally believe in God. So it's a very abstraction of a very fundamental common denominator. And when then that, that's applied, then you ask, does Christianity fundamentally believe in God? Yes. Okay, it believes in all kinds of other things. That's their business, I, really, between you and me. So what? So they believe in incarnation. They believe in Trinity. They believe in virgin birth. They, they believe, you go through the credo. Oh, they believe Mazel Tov. You know, so what's, what's, what's the problem? Who, who, who does it disturb? As long as they don't kill us, right? As long as they're, as long as they're not immoral. As, the, as long as the society is a good, ordered society, let them believe. The religion makes them better people. Ginook. That's the attitude. And that's the attitude that actually is very sane. I mean, today we look at the contribution of religions to the world. We're only asking one question nowadays. Are they peaceful or not, right? Are they violent or not? What kind of society do they create? Now, more than ever, we're asking the question, what is the contribution of religion to society? Well, that insight was already there in Meiri, who says, as long as they are fundamentally moral, that tells us it's fundamentally God and that's good enough for me, I'm not going to worry about all the rest. So that gives you a very, very a wide expanse of accommodating and accepting other religions. And that would, of course, also apply to the case of Hinduism. So once you've achieved this recognition, translators, I'm moving to section C. Once you've established that the religion is fundamentally legitimate through whatever strategy it is, what does that do? What does that say for the relationship? What does it say for the challenges what does it say for the opportunities? Now here, here we're looking at the following reality. Jews are discovering something in Hinduism that they find lacking in Judaism. Okay? Let's, let's look truth in the eye. Jews are finding something in Hinduism that they find lacking in Judaism. Spirituality, God talk, meditation, Intensity of spiritual life, 
Do they exist in Judaism? Of course, I know it. But sometimes it's a well-kept secret. It's available mostly in the ultra-Orthodox world. It's available mostly to men. It's available at a certain price that isn't available to most people who, who maintain their Judaism under other contexts. They don't have those opportunities. Hindus are easy. They've succeeded in, in copywriting certain techniques. The Hinduism that people see on the outside may not be the same Hinduism that Hindus practice. But the Hinduism that's exported is one that people can easily adapt into their homes. They get the benefit of meditation, of prayer, of a relationship, of a guru. Do Jews have gurus? Of course, we just mentioned the Lubavitcher Rebbe, great guru, great spiritual master, not the only one. And yet the, the Hindus have succeeded in exporting teachings, practices, techniques that have been found beneficial to people generally, but specifically to Jewish seekers. And their usefulness to Jewish seekers is to a large extent a function of a sense of crisis in Judaism. Judaism is in crisis. The Holocaust is one factor for that crisis. Modernity, leadership. Go back in time, go back to the destruction of the temple, to the loss of prophecy, to our sins, uh, fall of Edom, Adam, it's all women's fault. You can, you can put the crisis as far back in time as you would like. But the fact is, Judaism experiences a sense of crisis. A healthy, ideally, a healthy relationship between religions, in my worldview, which is why I convene religions together and I create opportunities for sharing between world religious leaders. In my view, a healthy relation between religions is one of mutual inspiration where we all grow together. In my view, all religions have faults, all religions have shortcomings. If you, if you share the finest, we all grow. And Reza will tell you in the quote that he's, he's, he'll be bringing forth in, in his presentation that this is indeed a Muslim view. It's foundational to a, uh, to a Muslim approach to other religions. Jews, on the whole, think that they have all the truth. On the whole, they tend to be much less receptive and open. But in fact, the population, the people, are in a situation where the failures of the religions come through, and they all too often need contact relationship with the finest of other religions. So if religious, Jew, if Jewish religious, I mean, I have facilitated situations in which prominent Jewish religious leaders sit with prominent Hindu swamis, and they, they receive teaching and inspiration that they find enriching spiritually to their own vocation. Mostly, the people who partake of those opportunities are people who have lost their identity, have lost their roots, have lost their affiliation, and they become something else. Most Jewish groups, sorry, most Hindu groups with a strong Western outreach have a strong presence of Jews and Jews at the leadership. This is the amazing situation. Hare Krishna, Jews at the top. Ramana Maharshi, Jews at the top. Sai Baba, Jews at the top. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, Jews at the top. Ama, you know, great Hindu guru, I think she comes to, to several places here in India, Jews at the top in terms of stra strategy. No matter how many Hindus there are, there's always going to be key Jewish people at the top. Amma is now talking of coming to Israel, of branching out and, 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 and to receiving her people there. So there's a, there's a great thirst, there's a great quest with Jewish people to find spirituality, and they turn to Hindu gurus. If it's, uh, uh, no, this wasn't part of the joke. So uh, if, if, uh, if, uh, if it's done well, optimally, responsibly, source of great enrichment. Done poorly, and here we come to the problem, compromising identity. And this has been the problem with Jews and with Judaism and other religions all along, is the problem of compromising identity. What, what are Jews worried about? Preservation continuity. This is the top item on Jewish, uh, the top item on the agenda of all Jewish organizations is continuity of Jewish life, continuity, continuity, continuity. It's all about that birthright Israel, maintaining awareness of Jewish community in exile, uh, sorry, diaspora. Uh, uh, it's all about maintaining continuity. So what has been considered for thousands of years the biggest threat? A connection with another religion. Common enemy? Really, we should be changing our narrative. Now should, we should be looking for collaboration with other religions as part of the strategy for Jewish survival. Believe it or not, some people are doing it. Hillel International has started... This boggles the mind. Hillel has started at least on one occasion, and I've heard of other groups who have been asked to do that, trips to India in order to strengthen sense of Jewish identity. If you want to strengthen Jewish identity, why are you going to India? Because the understanding is if you get stronger in your sense of Jewish spirituality, of, of spirituality, this will help enrich you and eventually bring you back to your Jewish roots. Is this faulty thinking or correct thinking? Depends on how it's done. Potentially, it's good. 
Because if, 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 if Hindus are not out there to missionize you, and you only receive the best of inspiration, then you look back to your tradition and you find it. The problem is that those same, some of the same Hindu teachers and swamis who were sitting with the chief rabbis and affirming we don't missionize had Jews sitting in their ashrams and not making the connection. Why are Jews sitting in the ashrams of these Hindu teachers while I'm sitting here making this declaration with the rabbis? Why is the chief rabbi sitting in India and addressing the Hindu leaders without asking the question, but what about the Jews that you have? Why aren't you returning them back to us? So these are the questions that have to be asked if there's a sincere exchange. But we cannot deny the fact that Jews have what to receive in India. Jews have what to receive from Hinduism. And it's an ongoing, shall we say, pastoral, spiritual concern. Uh, uh, the, Jews, uh, the Jews are engaged in. Um, I think I've said what's most important, or maybe I should, I should illustrate it with one more, with one more case. Gershom Scholem, whom all of you know because he came from Berlin. Uh, Gershom Scholem, the great scholar of Jewish mysticism, once made the point that the most famous and venerable Jewish woman after the Virgin Mary was the mother Mira Alfasa in the ashram of Sri Aurobindo. Let me explain. Uh, I believe she was Algerian, Mira Alfasa, in uh, early 20th century, came, I, I believe it's Algeria, I may be wrong, but Google will, Google will tell you, uh, or my book, uh, spent some time in Paris in theosophical circles, eventually came to India, uh, linked up with a prominent uh, Hindu philosopher mystic, Sri Aurobindo, and eventually became the moving figure uh, considered to be united with him and leading the movement after his death. I was there in their ashram just last year, and they really are considered Sri Aurobindo and the mother, and the mother often eclipsing him and becoming an object of worship and devotion of the devotees of that movement, which is an important movement in, in, uh, based in Pondicherry uh, in South India. So you have a Jewish woman who is the focus of the worship of Hindus, by virtue of her position in this particular Hindu movement. That's a very good example of how far uh, this, this, this cross-pollination uh, can occur. And the challenge is, for instance, in her case, so how much of her Judaism did she maintain? Not much. How much of her Judaism did she bring into the Indian reality? Well, maybe a lot, because some concerns for education, some concerns for equality, some some concerns for her managerial skills. Many things really bring forth a Jewish reality, but not in the name of Judaism, not in an explicit way. So you actually do end up having situations of reciprocity of Jews receiving from Hinduism and giving to Hindus, Hinduism, but they don't occur theologically. The reason they don't occur theologically is because very few Jews are in the process of having a reciprocal relation theologically, philosophically with Hindus, and therefore they end up contributing in other ways. Well, let me give you another example. Uh, there's a Swami called uh, uh, The Journey Home, the story of an American Swami, so Radhanath Swami. Radhanath Swami belongs to the Hare Krishna movement. They call themselves the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So he's a young Jewish boy who, according to his autobiography that I suspect is not being fully accurate, but a little bit uh, reshaped in order to serve as what he thought was a, should be a hagio autobiography. Uh, he describes himself as having gone not to Israel, but at a crucial point going to India and being led there and feeling like he has to serve Hinduism. So he receives from Hinduism his spiritual path instead of the Judaism that he never really had. That's the expression of the crisis. But then he creates communities and kitchens and charities and various ways of contributing to the life of India that really bring a Western and Jewish perspective, you could call it tikkun olam, if you will, to the Indian reality, creating a kind of reciprocity uh, of giving and receiving. So reciprocity, yes. Leadership, yes. Crisis, yes. And that crisis really can only be dealt with by better learning and understanding 
opening up to the mutuality of influence. If the kind of conversations that took place in the 2007 and 2008 summits continued into more sustained exchanges, and if more rabbis really understood the challenges and the opportunities, we would discover, and I think Reza is going to talk about this, how Hinduism in its finest, and for instance, in strands like Advaita Vedanta, the, you know, the monistic philosophy uh, propagated uh, through the figure of, of Shankara and many others, how that can serve as an enrichment and a challenge and a, an important theological conversation partner. Let me perhaps conclude with a statement by Heschel. Heschel said like this, had Judaism, instead of traveling to the west to Greece, following the destruction and exile, and taking on the Greek, the Greek forms of redefining Judaism. Had it traveled to the east, to the Benares, we would have had a whole other form of Judaism that grows not from the encounter with Greek tradition, but from the encounter with Hindu tradition. And then prophetically, Heschel added, the day may not be far when new encounters arise from this uh, meeting of Jerusalem and Benares, so to speak, of Jews encountering uh, Hindu tradition. This, this was said, I think, in the 60s. Little did he know how quickly that would become a reality and what opportunities that provides. And for a religion whose philosophy is largely in crisis and whose ritual is largely in crisis and whose spirituality is largely in crisis, not totally because there are many pockets of vibrant, alive spirituality, and yet this speaker considers Judaism on the whole to be a religion in crisis. The new conversations that are opened up through the encounter with Hinduism, once you've put aside the fear of idolatry, can serve as source of spiritual renewal, which is why I would say the finest, the most learned, the most dedicated, the most engaged, the most spiritual should be the ones at the forefront of this so that the encounter of Jews with Hinduism should not be that of the secular deracinated seeker, but should be the encounter of those who are committed, engaged, and open for the kind of mutual fructification and enrichment that can be the best of the encounter between religions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Goshen Gotchen, for a really inspiring talk. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, our next speaker, Dr. Reza Shah Kazemi. Um, I'll do this in German um, with a translation. Um, Dr. Reza Shah Kazemi is an Islamwissenschaftler und Religionswissenschaftler. Er hat seinen PhD in vergleichende Religionswissenschaft an der Kent Universität erhalten. Er forscht am Institut für Ismaili Studies in London, einer Forschungs- und Bildungseinrichtung, die ein geistiges Zentrum für die Glaub Glaubensgemeinschaft der Ismailiten bildet, einer Religionsgemeinschaft im schiitischen Islam. Wichtig zu erwähnen ist, dass er zu den Unterzeichnern des offenen Briefes ein gemeinsames Wort zwischen uns und euch in Anführungszeichen, gehört, mit dem muslimische Gelehrte christliche Kirchen zum Dialog über Gemeinsamkeiten der Religionen aufriefen. Er ist der Verfasser vieler Bücher, unter anderem Paths to Transcendence, According to Shankara, Ibn Arabi and Meister Eckhart. Ein weiteres Buch mit dem Titel The Other in the Light of the One, The Universality of the Koran and Interfaith Dialogue und ein anderer Titel Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism. So, we'd like to welcome you to the podium, Dr. Shah Kazemi. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. And many thanks to Alon for that very inspiring presentation. A very difficult act to follow. Um, for one thing, I'll probably speak at about a third of your... Most of understand you. <laughs> partly also for the, the sake of the translators. Um, so, uh, this is the outline of the talk that I will try and compress within 40 minutes. Um, these are the basic headings. We may not get, I, I see it's 8 o'clock now, so I'll try and finish it. At 8.40, we may not get very much discussion on history, um, because I really want to get to the heart of what I consider to be the issue 
between Islam and Hinduism, and that is on the, le the theological and the metaphysical plane. So um, I was told that's it. So th just to start with the historical encounter, um, in the year 711, the young general, Muhammad bin Qasim, conquers Sindh. And he comes across people who were apparently idolatrous. They were worshipping idols, uh, statues in their temples. They were a mixture of um, predominantly Buddhists, but also Hindus. And he didn't know what to do with these people after he had um, become the victor in, this, in, the, in the war. They appealed to him and said, look, allow us to rebuild our temples. We worship God, or we uh, are religious, we are moral people, to use the, the kind of criteria that, that Alon just used as well. They gave their arguments, and this young general wrote back to his uh, superior in Kufa, a man uh, notorious as a butcher, a very tyrannical person, called uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And this man, remember this is only uh, a, couple, a couple of generations away from the time of the Prophet. So this man consults his scholars and says, well, what do we do with these apparent idolaters? And they say to him, if they are paying the tax as religious minorities should, the dhimmis, then we should treat them as if they were people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, people of scripture, people who have received revelation, they're paying us the tax, we protect them and we allow them to worship as they see fit. So that was the famous Brahmanabad settlement, which opened the path to this, what I call a rich tradition of not just reverence for Hinduism, sorry, not just tolerance, but reverence. And that's a very important distinction. There's legal tolerance, which can often be accompanied by reluctance and a failure to respect, let alone venerate or love the religion and the, the founders of that religion and the, the adherents to that religion. Um, but especially among the Sufis in India, you will find this extraordinary cross-fertilization taking place between the Sufis, the mystics, and their counterparts in the Hindu traditions. Particularly the influence is known of the, the Sufis upon the Bhaktic movement in the, mid, in the Middle Ages. Um, I just put that book up there as a, as a reference for those of you who want to look at the, some of the details of this very rich process of interaction between Sufism and the, the yoga tradition, but it goes much further than that. Um, um, this Dara Shiku versus Aurangzeb, these were two princes in the Mughal period, 16th, coming into the, the, the early 1600s. Um, and it was Aurangzeb who was the victor uh, in the struggle for power once their father had died. And Aurangzeb is known as a more puritanical kind of Muslim who regarded the Hindus as idolaters, but who apparently did um, some, who continued the basic uh, paradigm of legal tolerance um, of the the Hindus that had been established by, in fact, the founder of the Mughals, Babur, but then really amplified and given a depth by Akbar, the famous Akbar in the Mughal period. So although there are some countervailing tendencies within Aurangzeb's view, it was a smothering of the voice of total acceptance, reverence, and love for the Hindu tradition and everything it represents that Dara Shiku, the prince, had. And he was killed by Aurangzeb um, after this, this civil war. And not before writing and translating, in fact, translating many works from the Hindu tradition, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, parts of the Upanishads. Um, he had them translated into Persian 
often himself doing the work. And this very famous book, Majma al-Bahrain, the meeting place or the coming together of two oceans. Um, and he argues that that is what took place on the soil of India, that Islam and Hinduism have these revealed traditions. And not only are they, as he, he says, the, the, not only are the Vedas, and by extension, all of the revealed and the inspired scriptures, uh, not only have they come from God, and therefore, quote, now I have to remember that I've just done this PowerPoint presentation with the help of Zofia, and that is a quotation mark. I have to remind myself, because uh, in England, in, when we write this in England, we put the quotation marks differently. In accordance with the Quran, or rather they were an interpretation of the Quran, which is a very interesting way of, as it were, making an ex post facto hermeneutical principle that even though the Vedas came before the Quran, they were a kind of anticipated commentary and interpretation of the Quran. It opens up a very different mode of perception regarding time and space when it comes to divine revelation. And I'll, I'll may come back to that later. Referring to his own book, Majma al-Bahrain, Dara Shakur says that discerning intelligent persons will derive much pleasure from this tract, while persons of blunt intelligence of either side will get no share of its benefits. Quite a, a, a strong statement saying, I don't care if the majority of the people on both sides of the divide will not be able to understand this. What matters to me is that, I, that as it were, he's codifying a rich tradition of 700 years in which the interaction between the mystics of both sides and the pious and the, and the de devoted ones of both sides to a certain degree were on common ground. That's all that concerns him and he was wanting to articulate this in a formal treatise. Um, now we come to theology. How could the Hindus be deemed to be recipients of revelation? Was Aurangzeb right when he referred to Dara Shaku as a heretic, as a blasphemer, as someone who himself had become an idolater because he accepted idolatrous worship as if it were true worship of God? So just go rather quickly through these uh, Quranic verses. First of all, well, these, these two are to be taken together. That at 1047, it says, for every ummah, for every religious community, there is a messenger. Very simple statement. Likulli ummatin rasul. So we have to ask ourselves the question, do the Indians, do the Chinese, do they constitute an ummah? Are they a religious community? Of course they are. Have they received prophets? Of course they have. So let's look at those prophets and those traditions with respect as if they were uh, authentic recipients of revelation. But it has to be linked to 4078, which says to the prophet, we certainly sent messengers before you. There are some of them that we have mentioned to you and there are others whom we have not mentioned. And that according to the prophet himself in a strongly attested hadith, there were 124,000 prophets sent to mankind by God. So people like me in the Islamic world find it relatively easy to put forward the argument without having to twist, as it were, our tradition in the way that, that um, Alon was saying has happened to some extent in the Jew Jewish tradition, to twist the truth to, or tw twist the traditional truths, conventional truths. We don't, I don't find it difficult to put forward the argument that Krishna, Rama, Lao Tzu, Chang Su, whichever tradition you look at, Tesan Win, the buffalo cow woman in the North American um, tradition of Indian spirituality in the Plains Indians who brought the sacred pipe. I find it very easy to say, well, of course, these are messengers of God. Look at what the Quran says and look at what the Prophet says. 2285 is also very important. 
because it tells every Muslim that believes in the Quranic revelation that if you are a believer in this revelation, do what the messenger believes in. The messenger believes, that's the Prophet Muhammad himself, the messenger believes in that which has been revealed unto him from his Lord. And so do the believers. We all have to believe in this if we want to be counted within this Muslim ummah. Everyone, every one of the believers believes in God and his angels and his scriptures and his messengers. And they say, we are supposed to say, we make no distinction between any of his messengers. La nufarriqu bayna ahadin min rusulihi. Absolutely clear. This farraqa is differentiation, saying that one is different from the other, one is better than the other, or something. It's very interesting. The Prophet heard someone saying that, yes, these other prophets were, were there, but for example, Jonah, he wasn't as great as Muhammad. And the Prophet heard this. And he said very emphatically, do not say that I am better than Yunus ibn Matta. Don't say I am better than Jonah. And then in another hadith he said, do not say I am better than Moses. And when he was asked the question, which is the religion that is most beloved by God? He didn't say the Islam that I've brought you. And he didn't name a religion. He just said, al hanifiya Asamha, which means the tolerant faith of the Hanif. And who is the Hanif? Abraham. He was saying that what matters in the eyes of God, what makes a, a soul lovable, is not the religion that he adheres to, or she adheres to, but the extent to which that religion instills in the heart of its adherents that primordial, generously tolerant faith of an Abrahamic nature. That was what the Prophet said. So the quint what is the quintessence of this religious message that the Quran brings? At 21, which is, it's a chapter entitled The Prophets Al-Anbiya. <coughs> So it's very significant that in this chapter called The Prophets, we should be told, we sent no messenger before you, but that we inspired him. In other words, we inspired every messenger that came before you, O Prophet, with the same essential message. There is no God except me, so worship me. And... Finally, before we come to, I think, uh, yeah, the universal salvation, one of the arguments that I would make and have made is that when the Quran tells us, as it does here in 262, that salvation is the result of that clause, whoever believes in God and the last day and performs virtuous deeds. Man amana billah wal yawmul akhir wa amila salihan. That is a huge expanse, throwing open, as it were, the gates of paradise. So everyone who can affirm belief in the absolute, and I've argued in that book that it was just referred to, Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism, that insofar as the Buddhists affirm the absolute, the essence, above and beyond all qualities, what Alon referred to as the formless aspect of the absolute. Um, insofar as the Buddhists affirm the essence of God above and beyond all conceivable, nameable attributes, they are to be seen in this category of believing in God, believing in the absolute and accountability to that God Belief in the day of judgment equals spiritual accountability to this absolute in whom we believe. And then, as the consequence of our belief in God and the last day, 
we have to perform virtuous deeds, we have to be righteous. And that means that it's not only those who believe in the Quran, the Muslims in the, in the narrow sense, those who believe, and the Jews, and the Christians, and the Sabians, there's a big debate about that, and many Muslim theologians have put into the category of Sabians, the Hindus and the Buddhists and, and the Neoplatonists and the Hermeticists and others. Um, but what really matters is this universal clause, that is if God is going to say, well, I'm not going to name every religion, every tradition. I'm going to just say, these are the criteria for salvation. Belief in God, belief in the accountability to that God, and then acting in consequence of that, those beliefs. And that is the formula for salvation. Their reward is with their Lord. No fear shall come upon them, neither shall they grieve. But of course we have to address the abrogating verses, the verses that traditional commentators have deemed to abrogate these universal sounding verses. And these are two of them. Truly religion with God, inna deen, عند Allah al-Islam. Truly religion with God is Islam. 319. And then at 385, whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will not be accepted from him and he will be a loser in the hereafter. So the majority of the commentators regard that kind of verse as abrogating 262, as if God could change his mind and say, well, at one point, the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians and whoever believes in God, they, they will be saved. But now God has changed, as it were, his mind on this and he said these two things. So it's one of those cases where the literal meaning of Islam is very, very important. That for, for the people who deem Islam to be referring only to the post-Muhammadan Sharia, Whereas if Islam is understood, as it were, literally, etymologically, one who makes submission, then it opens up again all the way, as it does, and I've put here, in the esoteric understanding of Islam, um, which is at the same time the literal meaning of the, of the word. Look at the context for 385. At 383, it says, do they seek something other than the deen of Allah, the religion of God, when all that is in the heavens and the earth submit to him? So that's the kind of Islam that's being built up in the context here, that it's the universal submission of all phenomena to the one and only creator. And then 384 makes it specifically religious, but not specifically post-Muhammadan, by saying, we believe in what all of the prophets are brought without distinction. And there it's, it's a beautiful verse, one of those three, I think, in the Quran that talk explicitly about saying, we believe in what God has revealed to us and to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and the tribes and to Ismail and all of the prophets, to Moses and to Jesus, what, everything that they have, uh, all of what they have received is what we accept. And we, again, make no distinction between any of them and we have submitted to him, to God. So that's what 384 says. Therefore, we can understand 385 to mean that a religion other than Islam is a religion that simply does not accept the oneness of God, the, re the ultimate reality. Now, we, to come to the oneness, we, I hope we're coming to, well, very quickly, um, 548, um, we have revealed to you the scripture with the truth confirming what is before it of I, sh I should have put the scripture there as well it's not as if there are two words we have revealed to you Al-Kitab the book, the scripture and confirming what is before it of the scripture and the guardian over it so the two words there in Arabic are Musaddiq and Muhaymin confirming all scripture that came before the Quran and protecting it. And then it goes on to say, if God had willed, sorry, for each we have appointed a law and a way, shir'a and a minhaj, if God had willed, he could have made you one community, one ummah. 
but he that he might try you by that which he has given you, he has made you as you are. The reason for this, again going back to what Alon said, compete with each other in good works. That's the purpose, one of the main purposes of this diversity of religious revelation, of divine revelation to different communities. Compete with one another in good works. Unto God you will all return, and he will inform you about that regarding which you had differences of opinion. There's a brief note at the bottom there, at 26196, that the Zubur al awwalin the first scriptures, is understood by some uh, to refer to the, to the Puranas, because the word Purana means, it's related to the word that means oh, ancient or old. But we need to move along. So yes, this is where I say that um, we, it's a, an, a, a mutual enrichment that not only did the Sufis give a great deal to the Bhaktic movement uh, in Hinduism in the Middle Ages, but we received a great deal from Advaita Vedanta in particular, and we can continue to understand the meaning of our own verses in the way that Dara Shuku invites us to do, to see the Hindu scriptures as a kind of commentary on verses of the Quran. And this is one example that I, I came across just when I was doing the preparation for this talk. Um, at 1651, there's a command from God, do not say there are two gods, do not take two gods, ilahain ithnain. There is only one God. Now, whereas the Quran <coughs> refers to a trinity uh, and then refers not, in fact, to the Christian Orthodox Trinity, but says, do not take three gods. This question about taking two gods is rather intriguing. And one of the ways in which we can understand it is by looking at the Chandogya Upanishad. That simple statement about what, what the reality is, that which has no second. And in the Sufi tradition, that is a perfect expression that could slot straight into a whole series of, of philosophers and, and mystics, metaphysicians of the Sufi tradition. That which has no second affects a shift from what is called in the tradition Tawheed Ilahi, a oneness on the plane of theology, to Tawheed Wujudi, to a oneness on the plane of being, a unity of being, that there are not two orders of reality, one up there somewhere which is divine and a completely different independent one down here which is not divine. Rather there is only one reality that is transcendent, above all things, imminent within all things. And that's the oneness of being associated chiefly with the, the great um, Sheikh al-Akbar, as he's called, the greatest of the Sufi masters, Ibn al-Arabi. But we can also look to Imam Ali, who in many ways is the forebear of the, the Sufis. All of the Sufi brotherhoods, the tariqas, go back to Imam Ali on their way to going back to the Prophet. So many of his statements are, as it were, a instinct, a deeply in, within them are deeply embedded universal metaphysical principles that went on to be elaborated by the later mystics. But at the Battle of Jamal, at the first civil war of Islam, in Imam Ali's caliphate, Imam Ali was the fourth caliph, the first imam for the Shia Muslims, um, and this terrible battle was about to take place in his caliphate when he's confronting not just com fellow companions, the Prophet's wife, Aisha, but also cousins, relatives, fellow Muslims. It was a terrible uh, fitna, uh, to use the Arabic word, which is kind of sedition, um, disaster, and... Uh, it was, it, it's always very, very difficult to talk about this, but I call it the 
Islamic Kurukshetra of the Mahabharata to help us to understand in Hindu terms exactly the same thing that was going on in the Mahabharata with cousins fighting against cousins in the battlefield of Kurukshetra with the Pandavas and the Kauravas fighting it out. Um, and on the field of battle, a Bedouin comes to Imam Ali and says, what do you mean when you say that God is one? And the Imam's companion said, this isn't the time for such questions. Let, you know, the Imam is going to go into battle. And Imam Ali said, no, let him come and ask his question. And I will answer it. And the answer he gave is this, that the meaning of the oneness of God is, and this is the exact Arabic phrase, ma la thani lahu, that which has no second. It's completely like a translation of what we've just seen from the Chandogya Upanishad. That which has no second does not enter the category of number. So don't think of God's oneness as if it were one as opposed to many up there. It's not of a numerical order. The divine oneness is of an ontological order, not just theological. It's wujud, which is being, and not just uluhiya, which is divinity. It's not just that. It's a tremendous shift of consciousness that he's putting into effect by this one statement. And it's as if Imam Ali on the, in this battlefield is like Krishna and Arjuna because he was still, although he was about 59, he was still the, the most renowned and invincible warrior of his time. So he was both the Arjuna and the Krishna imparting wisdom on the field of battle. And this takes me to something that occurred to me only recently, that um, that sentence at the bottom Looking at the face of Ali is an act of worship. It's a strongly attested hadith, a statement of the Prophet. Anadaru ila wajhi Ali ibadah. To look at the face of Ali is an act of worship. And I've argued in various places that this is a way in which we have an, a window to what the Hindus call darshan, the seeing of a saint, is in and of itself a way of worshipping the supreme divinity within Hinduism. And the Prophet is saying something that the orthodox-minded within Sunni Islam have great difficulties in understanding. How can looking at the face of Ali be an act of worship? Is that not idolatrous? But it's a strongly attested. And in fact, it's Abu Bakr himself, the first caliph, who was seen to be staring at Ali and his daughter said, why are you looking at him like that? And Abu Bakr said, because I heard the Prophet say, looking at the face of Ali is an act of worship. As regards avatars, this is a, a major question. I mean, how people would ask me, how can you accept Hinduism when it's so, so central a feature of Hinduism is the belief in the avatars of Vishnu. Krishna being the eighth avatar of Vishnu and so on. My answer would be, again, it helps us to understand what is at play, both in the Hindu tradition as regards the, the essence of this avataric idea, the embodiment of divine qualities within and as human beings. When we look at the chapter on Mary, 19 and verse 17, where the angel appeared to, I haven't given the, the exact wording there. Um, the, the key word is tamathul. Because what it says at, at verse 17 is that فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيَّ So we sent to her our spirit and it transformed it, so it took on the appearance of tamathul, of a perfectly formed human being. So in this adoption of a form, the spirit of God has taken on the form of a perfect man, which I would argue is a clear parallel to the spiritual principle 
in, implicit in the avataric paradigm. And this is strengthened, I, I would say, that this argument, this point of view is strengthened if we look at this hadith atahawwul. That means the, the statement of the Prophet, again, a very uh, strongly attested statement by him describing the Day of Judgment. And like tamathul, this is a word tahawwul, which means transforming of oneself. And according to this very, very important uh, description of the Day of Judgment, God appears to the Muslims in a form that they don't recognize. And they say, we seek refuge in Allah from you, as if to say, whatever you are. And then God says to them, is there any form by which you would recognize your Lord? And then they say yes, and they say which form. And then God obligingly, as it were, yatahawwala, he undergoes a transformation in accordance with the form under which the, by which the Muslims would recognize him as the Lord. Ibn Arabi, in recounting this hadith, says the situation is now as it will be on the Day of Judgment. In other words, God is constantly undergoing transformation in every form, all around us, all the time, but we don't recognize it. So, ethics. Um, a very, very brief, again, a little window, but the kind of argument that I would make to help um, Muslims to see that on the ethical plane also we're at one, not, not in the obvious sense that, um, that good ethics are, are commended in both traditions, but in the less obvious sense, which is we find in Nishkama, the concept of Nishkama Karma in the Bhagavad Gita, the idea that Krishna, the principle that when you act, when you're doing your duty, you have to completely eliminate any desire for the fruits of your activity. That's nish, kama, negating desire in your karma, in your actions. And that means you're completely detached from your, the fruits of your actions, but completely committed to performing them to the best of your ability. It's that particular balance that is a very difficult one to achieve. And we have um, in the story of the Ahl al-Bayt, that's the family of the Prophet's household, a beautiful expression of Nish Kama Karma at the Surah number 76, um, Surah al-Insan, um, where the Prophet's family are fasting three days consecutively. And at the end of each day, someone comes and asks for alms, and they give away the food that they were going to eat themselves. And this is not mentioned in the, in the surah. What's mentioned is only that they feed, for the sake of God, three categories of people that correspond to these three who came to them. A poor person, an orphan, and a prisoner. And they say to these people, we are feeding you for the sake of God, and we desire from you no thanks and no reward meaning that they're acting purely and simply for the absolute, they're doing their duty, they're being generous, but they are expecting nothing on this earthly plane in, uh, in recompense for it. And the same idea is given in the Surah Al-Layl, the Surah of the Night, and this is uh, a description, the commentators say, of Abu Bakr, who... Um, purchased a slave at great price and he is described as someone who works only for the sake of God um, and that he alone will be content. Contentment arises only out of this action which is selfless and only for the sake of God. 
we can go into that later. I just want to get to our last... Yes, I think we'll, we have to finish here. Unfortunately, um, I can't go into much detail on this, but Japa Yoga in Hinduism is regarded, which is the invocation of a name, whether of Rama or Krishna or Om, a whole variety of names in the tradition. But to repeat this methodically on your tongue, in your mind, in your heart, that is Japa Yoga, the, the way of uniting yourself through invocatory repetition, incantation. And it's referred to in the Hindu tradition as the most effective path to moksha, to deliverance, total liberation. This is not posthumous. It's the one that takes place in this lifetime if you reach the end of the path through the prescribed practices. But according to the Vishnu Purana and the Srimad Bhagavatam, and some argue it's even in the Mahabharata, um, that the most effective path to deliverance in this lifetime, in this era of the Kali Yuga, I don't think I, yes, I should have put there, that, that this is, in the Hindu tradition, in the Kali Yuga, the dark age in which we are now, the fourth of the four ages that make up a Maha Yuga, a grand cycle. In this dark age, the most effective path to salvation in this world and in the hereafter is Japa Yoga to invoke, to repeat the name of the Lord constantly. And that is what we find expressed in its own way, mutatis mutandis, in the Quran, 2945. It says that the salah, the prayer, keeps you away from evil and iniquity. Inna salata tanha'anil fahsha'i wal munkar, wala dhikrullahi akbar. While... One could translate the, the word wa here as not so much while or and, but but. It's a deliberate juxtaposition with the dhikr being placed above the canonical prayer, the remembrance of God being the purpose of the canonical prayer. So while prayer keeps you away from evil, the th remembrance of God is greatest. Wala dhikrullahi akbar. It is the greatest of all possible things on the liturgical, the sacramental, on the devotional path. And finally, um, the hadith of the Prophet, uh, that he says, for everything there is a polish, and the polish of the hearts is dhikrullah. Dhikrullah can be understood, dhikr can be understood both as, f as remembrance, m mentioning, thinking of, being aware of, but it also means constant repetition of the divine name to repeat on your lips, in your mind, in your heart, with your whole body. And this takes us back to what we started with, the way in which yoga techniques entered so much into Sufi practice in India in the Middle Ages um, and before. And that, uh, even to the point of pranayama, the, the breathing techniques, and we have stories of Sufis who would utter the divine name by breathing out and performing a kind of pranayama where this elongation of the name Allah goes on for hours and they've learned to control their breath and then the inhalation will take hours. So we finish on this um, rather mystical note, but I, I, I notice that I have gone over my time and I apologize for that, but I think we will have time both with Alon in conversation, but we'll open up to questions shortly thereafter, I hope. Thank you for your attention. Let me just say thank you, Dr. Shah Kazemi, for your talk. That was very inspiring. Um, as you just said, mentioned, I think we'll uh, start the conversation with the responses to each other. Um, and then we'll open um, the questions to the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. It's, it, this was really, really inspiring. I'm, I can't make up my mind if, I, if I'm better off being a Hindu or, or a Muslim. Um, there, there are two things I want to say by way of response. One is a sharing, and one is a, and one is a question. By way of sharing, 
uh, on those texts. Well, actually, I just want to acknowledge the importance of the final quote here being a reference to Sophia when it says that for everything there is a Polish and, uh, and her wonderful contribution to, to preparing this, uh, this evening. So thank you again, Sophia. Um, I want... She, as long as she knows, <laughs> that's all that counts is that she should know. Um, so the, this one without a second, and the question of the similarities and the fundamental teachings. Uh, I, I had earlier alluded to this question of monotheism versus monism, which you very much tied into now with, your, uh, with this discussion. And I discuss here or I thought I discussed, since I can't find anything, I don't know what I discussed, but uh, a, a comparison between this Vedantic perspective that you reference here and a discussion of the Jewish philosopher, specifically Maimonides. Let me just read to you some, some of the opening passages from his Mishneh Torah, his, his classical legal codex, but it begins with a, with a philosophical statement. The foundation, and I want you... Reza, and I want you, the audience, and I want you to listen to it both from your Muslim perspective and from a potential Hindu perspective. And tell me if you, you know, spot the differences. The foundation of foundations and the pillar of wisdom is to know there is a primordial being and that he brought about all that is, and all, all that is, that is, that exists, of heaven and earth and what is between exists only on the account of the truth of his being. If one were to consider that he did not exist, not el naught else could exist. And if one were to consider that all beings other than him are not, in other words, they don't exist, he alone would exist and would not be annihilated on their account. For all that is needs him, but he, blessed be he, does not need them, nor one of them. Therefore, his truth is not like the truth of one of them. So the sense of the absolute existence of, of God and nothing else matching up his existence is something I think you could very much resonate with. The difference really becomes when for the Hindu... And this you illustrated beautifully to us, and that's what I want to bring out, where for the Hindu, their being actually is part of his being, whereas for Imanis, their being is distinct. God has his being, being is outside, the rest of being is outside him. So the true being is God, but not everything as God. And the key difference is that for Hindus, everything exists as God. And the move that you made, which was very intriguing, is to give a Muslim Hindu reading of the existence of all of creation, not as a monotheism where God alone exists and everything else does not, but as a monism where everything else is part of, is part of God. And it's interesting to contrast that with, uh, uh, with the Maimonidean reading. Do you want to respond to that before I move to the second point? You got your own. It's on. You can oh, just, yeah, just speak. Oh, you don't have to. Oh, I don't. Uh, is that? Yeah. Yes. Um, I would just point out that the word part of God wouldn't be acceptable to the, the Sufis, and I don't think to the Hindu. It, 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 used ill-advisedly. should have been expression of God. Manifestation, manifestation of God, exactly. Manifestation of God, not, not yeah. part of God. If I said part of God, that's just because I'm a bad theologian. <laughs> um, and the second is that from what you call the monistic point of view, which can be regarded as a bridge between Advaita Vedanta and Islam understood from a, a metaphysical Sufi point of view. Um, it's extremely important to emphasize that there's a, a, a mystical paradox at the heart of this oneness that cannot be verbally articulated. It can only be evoked. Um, and I think one of the best evocations of the paradoxical simultaneity of transcendence and immanence, this is the key, I think, to understanding why people like Maimonides would emphasize, as most Muslim theologians do, Tanzih, transcendence. God is absolutely distinct from, other than, uh, remote from anything existent, anything existential. Um, but the complementary dimension, which is imminence, of God being present within and as and through everything, that 
is a relationship, transcendence and immanence, is one that can only be hinted at through deliberately paradoxical language intended to break the carapace of the mind of conceptual language, of formal thought, in order to penetrate the heart, where the heart can grasp this or glimpse it or s begin to realize it. And I think one of the clearest expressions of this mystery, if that's not a paradox in itself, um, is Imam Ali's statement that God is with everything, but not through conjunction. God is with everything, but not as a sort of second thing joined to the thing. And he's other than everything, but not through separation. So there's a withness or a presence which is not a second thing alongside that thing. It constitutes the very reality of the thing. But there's this transcendence, this complete otherness, but not through separation. So he's exalted in his very proximity and he's close in his exaltation. And that kind of language we, is what we need to evoke the paradoxes that we get from the mind to the heart. Thank you. Now, I want to go on to a completely different uh, question. I've spoken about the big picture of Judaism today, and I've described Judaism as being in crisis, and I've described the potential of a Jewish-Hindu relationship to the crisis of Judaism. You have told us about the um, fundamental spiritual or the potential for fundamental spiritual commonality and recognition, uh, both theologically and morally and mystically, between Islam and Hinduism. And you've told us that there have been precedents, uh, but there have been these two brothers. Uh, and ultimately, they, there was a little bit of fratricide there with uh, Aurangzeb killing Darashiko. And Darashiko is the one, you know, you, you, seem to, you sound a lot like Darashiko. You're a Darashikoite. Uh, but does the fact that Aurangzeb killed his brother means that you lost out, that your view of Islam is minoritarian or non-existent? Do we have nowadays a balance between these two? Is this a lost tradition? Do you represent a voice that has been lost and needs to be reclaimed? What's going on in Islam today as a carryover of those two brothers and how do we situate all the inspiring teachings that you provide us in relationship to the history and above all in relationship to what's happening in Islam today? It's quite a question. <laughs> um, it's a voice that is being smothered by the shrill cries of the fundamentalists, the, the activists, the militants, the terrorists. Um, and I would say that the smart, I, I don't think that the killing of, of Dara Shukur is anything more than a symbol. I don't think one can say that, for example, the fundamentalism in Pakistan today can retrace its steps back to an Aurangzeb. I really don't think one can say that. Um, because too much of the Sufi tradition, too much of this inclusivism and this reverence, and this interaction between the, the mystics on both sides, too much of it took place after Aurangzeb and right up until the, the British Raj and even through the Raj, it was happening at the grassroots level. As you can see in the extraordinary phenomenon of Hindus and Muslims worshiping together continuously with great fervor and commitment at the same shrines. Muslims at Hindu shrines, Hindus at, at the shrines of the saints of the Sufis, indistinguishable. And that has never really stopped, you see, in the subcontinent. It's still, to some extent, going on. I mean, it never stopped until the, the colonial, post-colonial period and partition and all the problems that brought on. But because that continued, it would be too simplistic to say that the whole perspective associated with Dara Shuku sort of 
was done to body blow by Aurangzeb. Yes, he was much more exclusive. He was much more exoteric. He was more Arabocentric. He was more, instead of being Indocentric, mystically inclined. But he accepted the Sufis as well. In fact, he was buried very simply as if he were a Sufi by a Sufi shrine. But um, it's really, I would have to, I suppose if I have to give a simple answer to this, it's since in the last 50 years or so that Islam has come to be deracinated, I think that's the word I'm looking for, pulled up from its roots, the roots which have always included this inclusivist aspect of the Quran, this universalist view, always been there in the Sufi and the mystical traditions and the devotional traditions. But in the last 50 years or so, with the politicization of the Muslim world, um, one has seen that those mystical roots that are uh, going back to the spiritual and metaphysical um, mysteries of the Quran and the prophetic practice, um, those roots have been pulled up by politicized Islam. But it's, at the, I'm mixing my metaphors a bit, but at the grassroots level, um, the impact of the spiritual universalist dimension of the Quran is still working with the Muslim masses, as it were. But on the political plane, because the fundamentalists and the fanatics and the terrorists are making such a huge um, hue and cry about their perspective and what they think is right, it's just drowning out this alternative voice. But I don't think it's, it's, it's not operative at the grassroots level. It's still there. I is believe. there one recommendation you could make on what ideally the Islamic Ummah needs or should do in order to address the situation? Uh, I can't think of uh, anything other than to say what my teacher, Dr. Lings, used to say, that let the Quran speak for itself. Don't go in for these uh, strategies of abrogation to get rid of the, um, the verses that literally speak about all peoples having access to salvation through their religions. Read the Quran and take it at face value and let it speak for itself and it will express this universality, this inclusivity, this, um, this, this great ethics. It'll do, it, it'll do the job much better than we can. I think um, we should open up to the floor. Um, I think I would like to, I have many questions and a few, but um, I would like to give the audience a chance to, um, maybe we'll take two or three questions um, from the audience if they're... Der Islam und der Hinduismus, die haben eine Gemeinsamkeit, die tendieren beide stark zur Frauenverachtung. Und können Sie zu dem Thema uh, auch noch was sagen? Uh, to um, uh, uh, misogyny um, in, in Hinduism and Islam, um, that there's a, there's a common uh, uh, negative attitude towards women. Um, and if you would... Uh, is, right, let's collect questions. I hope to phrase it shortly and concise. Um, I was missing a little bit um, in, in the, in the uh, talk you, you both, the argument you both made, some sort of a structural problem of all monotheistic religions, which is somehow coming to terms with recognizing yeah, that there is another set of truth. I mean, you, you somehow addressed it in a way, um, but for me, my, the basic difficulty of all monotheistic religions with polytheism is you have to come to terms with a tradition which tells you there is more or less only one truth. Be it the seal of the prophet, to, to, uh, to mention this one uh, very popular uh, metaphor for Islam. Um, and Hinduism seems to be 
a challenge to this to this claim and to go on a little further um, I see it very parallel to the idea of moder modernity modernity where which is a more monotheistic idea there's science there's you can realize what the world is the modern idea of the world age of reason blah blah, blah. and there is some sort of um, postmodernism where suddenly many truths are acceptable, many ways of life. Um, so my idea would be, okay, maybe monotheism is something of the past modern times. They have failed. They have led, up, led us to, to terrible wars. Maybe it's time for just you know, stepping back and saying, okay, we have had our go. This is the time of postmodern idea of the world, which is Hinduism. Thank you. Should we take um, th the third question and then maybe you can respond? Okay. Um, I would have a question to the first uh, speaker. Just a question of um, understanding. As you said, um, like where is the problem? Or you said there is a question of adultery um, regarding to Hinduism. That this is was a key question of the. Um, of the conference you had between um, Jewish and Hindu, but what would be the problem if uh, Hindus are considered as being idolatry? Like, is it a problem more for the Hindus or for the Jews? Like, um, w would the would it be a problem for the Hindus to consider their some themselves as some um, idol, idol? I don't know what's the term like being idolatry, or I think you got my point. Like. Is it a problem to their eyes or to the eyes of the monotheist religion? Yeah, this would be my question. Thank you. Who would like to respond? So I'll go backwards. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it goes back to the question of so what? So they're idolaters. Where's the problem, right? Um, so Meiri would say, if they're immoral, then that, that's where the problem lies. Otherwise, where's the problem? We have such a strong tradition of opposition to idolatry that very often we lose sense of this, lose track of this question. So what exactly is the problem? Um, the, there is a strand from biblical down to contemporary halachic rulings that says you avoid contact with idolaters partly because of the moral implications, partly theological, partly because of a broader orientation that is uh, you, keep, you keep away from things that are undesirable. And that can get in the way of doing business, that can get in the way of collaboration, that can get in the way of even creating alliances. So some people say it doesn't matter, you know, common enemy, common enemy, I don't care. And the other says no, but I still need some minimal requirements. When you see the conversations that the rabbis and the swamis had, the Jews needed to clear the hurdle of idolatry as a condition even for engaging in common diplomatic initiatives. So where the problem is, it's because how deeply the approach goes to, towards idolatry. Could the argument be made that it doesn't really matter what they, what they worship as long as, you know, let's say we're fighting for the environment together? Absolutely, you can make that. But it's, it goes so deeply that there is this concern of seeing of seeing where, they're, where the other religion is. In other words, what I failed to address, and your question brings to light, is how deeply offensive, problematic the approach to idolatry is that it keeps that distinction. Now, part of the challenge is, is it a problem for Jews or is it a problem for others? And this in turn also revolves on the question, are we applying the same criteria or different criteria? But even if you apply different criteria, which is really the answer, there is a deep gut reaction of distance. Uh, and one of the things in dealing with this question is you're not dealing with ideas. You're dealing with ideas and attitudes and inherited attitudes. And sometimes the ideas allow something, but you have deep attitudes that you've got to work through. And in relationship between groups and histories and approaches to other religions, it's not pure about theology. At least to get to theology, you have to sometimes purify some attitudes. And one of the core attitudes is the rejection of idolatry. Even the answer that you propose, problem for us, problem for them, is already part of a reasoning process that has to come then. Um, I personally am not convinced by the identification of, uh, 
of Hindu polytheism, so-called polytheism and postmodernity. Uh, postmodernity really is something that, that lacks a point and is totally subjective, whereas Hindu polytheism uh, really is a, a, is a point of being anchored much more firmly, and as Reza has showed us, and as the much of the tradition indicates, is really an expression of a unity that finds its expression in diversity, and therefore the philosophical assumptions of the two are very different. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't so easily say, well, this has failed, that, therefore let's give them an option. Yes, maybe on the level of tolerance, maybe attitudinally. In other words, the difference, the same answer that I gave before, the distinction between attitudinal and philosophical position may apply here. Maybe attitudinally you've got something there, but philosophically I wouldn't, ident I wouldn't describe Hinduism as postmodern. As to the question of misogyny, let's just say the following. Hinduism, all religions are caught in a deep paradox between on the one hand, voices, attitudes of the greatest esteem to women and social realities that are very oppressive. Uh, Hinduism has the most noble attitudes to women and in some ways explores femininity in the most magnificent ways and on the other hand has some very oppressive practices. This probably occurs in all the religions in one way or another. And this is where, in the same way that uh, theology on the one hand and attitude mixed together, so it is in the case of uh, idealism and approaches and social cultural attitudes, and part of the process of our growth is working through these issues. Thank you very much, Alan. I, I agree with everything that Alon said. I would just add one um, point about uh, your question about monotheism versus polytheism. Um, that the problem with arguing about putting the case forward that uh, in the postmodern world uh, we have to open up to something akin structurally to the polytheism of Hinduism is that it uh, allows through the back door its own form of structural violence. Because if you're saying or if you're proposing that the monotheisms have tried and failed and we should go into this postmodern world which is structurally akin to polytheism. The implication is that those who adhere to monotheism at whatever degree of rigidity or inclusivity, exclusivity, whatever degree it may be, that those people somehow have to be forced into a new structure. And that imposes its own structural violence. It, it introduces it through the back door. In, uh, that's, that's the only thing I would say to that question. And as regards my misogyny, I would agree with Alon and say that it's the task of all of us who believe deeply in our traditions at their roots and not in their manifestations, all of them. In other words, those of us who deeply believe in the Quran and the Prophet as revelations from God, it's the task of all of us to go back to those roots and to reinterpret the principles, reapply them in accordance with what has clearly been an ethical failure on the part of our tradition when it comes to women in particular, and not to be shy about saying that there have been terrible things done in the name of Islam against women and terrible interpretations of the law. And that we go back to the Quran, we go back to the spirit of those uh, revelations, we go back to the spirit of what the Prophet said, and we apply the spirit in a way that accords with the needs of rectifying these clear ethical failings in our tradition, whether it be about misogyny or the application of, of um, uh, the hudud, the punishments in Islamic law. In all these areas, we have to be brave enough to say that we do believe in our tradition, but we believe more in the roots of our tradition than in all of its manifestations. We don't have to look at our tradition as if it's a tribe supporting its uh, antecedents, it, our, our ancestors. 
it's that there are some things that we are proud of, other things that we're ashamed of. And the treatment of women is a particularly important area for all of us to see that we have fallen short of the standards set by the Prophet himself in this regard and that that's the example that we should follow. Von meinem Verständnis her waren ja im Laufe der Menschheitsgeschichte zuerst ähm, poly- oder pantheistische Religionen vorhanden, bevor es dann zu monotheistischen Religionen kam. Und ähm, ich denke, weil die Menschen eben auch ähm, mehr in der Natur gelebt haben, mit der Natur verbunden gelebt haben und einzelne Elemente der Natur ähm, auch als göttlich beseelt empfunden haben und ähm, für sich dann eine, ja, polytheistische Religion daraus äh, gebildet haben und sie sich entwickelt hat. Und ähm, mit äh, der Entfremdung zur Natur, denke ich, sind dann wahrscheinlich auch monotheistische Religionen entstanden, die ja doch ähm, mehr ähm, im Abstrakten sich befinden. Und ähm, wäre das vielleicht nicht auch äh, eine Anregung, doch noch mal ähm, auch an ähm, diese äh, ja, also an diese Tatsachen zu denken und ähm, vielleicht auch ganz heilsam so für, also wenn man sich in einer monotheistischen Religion befindet, dass man auch noch mal bedenkt, dass, äh, ähm, ja, dass wir vielleicht äh, vieles äh, gar nicht, mit vielem gar nicht mehr so vertraut sind wie, wie früher in polytheistischen Religionen. Um. I guess she was saying that historically. Sorry. I don't think you understood about five. <laughs> um, sort of historically, the, the the pantheistic or polytheistic religions were uh, were earlier than monotheism um, in the evolvement. And um, I, if I understood correctly, uh, uh, the, the, the 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 asker said that she feels that the polytheistic aspect um, was a closer, uh, a, a closer relationship of humans to nature and that there was a certain entfremdung um, or sort of that, that, that turn to monotheism uh, uh, is in a way a, 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 a turning away from natural pheno phenomena and um, if you would comment on that. It's my, it's my turn. <laughs> It's my turn to go first. No, I, 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 um, I could um, sense that it was a, an important question, even if I could only understand a few words. Um, the, uh, the verse that comes to my mind, I have to say, as I, you know, I've been preaching that let the Quran speak for itself, so I should let the Quran answer this question, that in fact, polytheism did not come first. Um, the worship of God, th the worship of God through phenomena is, if you like, the, through the phenomena of virgin nature. That predates polytheism. So the actual formulation of God's um, is something that came much later, both in terms of, of writing, of theology, philosophy. It came much later than what we could call the primordial worship of God through the phenomena of virgin nature. So the, the, the phenomena, the sun, the stars, the moon, the trees, the rivers, the oceans, these were not conceived as gods in a polytheistic way in what preceded formal theological polytheism. If you like, I'm talking about the Adamic perfection and what the Hindus would call the, the golden age and then the ages that followed, the, the Satya Yuga, the Krita Yuga is the golden age where in there is no need for formal religion, no need for a God to reveal anything because each human being, according to the Hindu conception of the 
the Satya Yuga, the Krita Yuga. Every human being was born with innate knowledge of all reality from the highest to the lowest and that God was seen and loved and worshipped through every single phenomenon. That's the Adamic perfection. And only when this degenerated from down to the ages, Treta Yuga, Dvapara Yuga, Kali Yuga, down through the phases that the Hindus regard this cosmological decline, at a certain point, um, polytheism in the, in the idolatrous sense set in, where God was mistaken, where the, the stone, the image, whatever it may be, was mistaken for the absolute. That's idolatry in the lowest sense, the idolatry that Abraham came to fight. That God cannot be contained by these images. God is not there. He doesn't speak through them. He is not present. And as the Quran puts it, these are but names that you have named. Asma'un sammetumuha. You have put these names on things and they are not divinity. They are not real. This is in total contrast to the Hindu tradition where the gods are represented symbolically in the form of icons, in the form of statues, and they are worshipping God through those forms. They are not reducing the transcendence of God to the measure of the particular statue or representation of Rama or Krishna or all of the other gods because those are self-manifestations of God revealed by God, by the Paramatman, by the Brahma that has no qualities, reveals itself. I, I, uh, Rama Krishna puts this very well. He said, it's as if the ocean, which Brahma is in its essence, that ocean has become ice in a few places so that you can identify something to orient your worship towards. The ice is nothing other than the water, but its form is a self-revelation by the supreme transcendent reality in order to enable worship to be directed to something that is formal and therefore a representation of Rama or Krishna or the other de uh, divinities. But they are seen through, and it's exactly the same in Christianity. In, I think it's one of the letters of St. Paul that he says that the Father is what we worship and the Son is what we worship the Father through. So the worship of the Christian is directed to our Father, which art in heaven, but it goes through Jesus Christ in exactly the same way as in the Hindu tradition. The worship of the pure absolute of Brahma Nirguna, above and beyond cosmic qualities, passes through the self-manifestation of that absolute as relatively absolute, as something that is at once relative with the form that gives you an orientation, what we would call in Islam a qibla, but at the same time, it's transparent. It's not opaque. It's not that you're worshipping the thing. So that form of authentic polytheism within Hinduism is to be distinguished from the corrupt, degenerate <laughs> form of polytheism, the Babylonian kind of uh, polytheism that and the Akai and all of the, 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 the earlier traditions that Abraham was combating and that Islam inherited. It was against a point of view that had lost symbolism, the sense of the symbol, so that the gods were no longer transparent, they were no longer symbols, and they were but empty shells of what they used to be, and often occupied by the psychic energy that it had uh, absorbed from the false devotion given to it as a false god. Um, so the Prophet's destruction of these idols within Mecca is not in any way to be identified with the negation of 
the gods of, of Hinduism. It's on a completely different level. And the verse that came to my mind as you, were, as you finish your question, um, that the Quran states about the primordial tradition through which God, by which God is worshipped through all the phenomena of nature, is verse 53 of chapter 41, 4153, which says, we shall show them our signs. And the word used is ayat, the plural of aya. And this means both a verse of scripture and a sign in nature and a sign of a miraculous order. Jesus is regarded as a, a miraculous sign to the whole of creation, ayat on linnas. So this verse says, we shall show them our signs, our verses of scripture, our revelations. Fil athaq, on the horizons around them, wa fi anfusihim, and in their own, and in their own souls until it becomes clear to them, to humanity, that he or it is the truth. And this verse helps us to see the whole of the shamanistic, pre-polytheistic tradition. Today, if we look at the, the Native American traditions, for example, they would identify with this verse and say, yes, this is our religion. We see God on the horizons all around us in everything of, of nature. We see God, God's face there. And we see that face in our own souls. These signs, these revelations of scripture are there in, in virgin nature and in our own spiritual, in the very fitra, what's called the, the primordial human nature with which we were created and which we have allowed to degenerate. Um, so there's a correspondence between this macrocosmic revelation that virgin nature constitutes and the microcosmic revelation, which is given to us by inspiration, individual inspiration that meets this macrocosmic revelation of God through all things, all phenomena. I'm sorry, I, I've taken up. But it's, ah, no, it's working. So um, I heard a lot about your perspective on Hinduism, but what I missed somehow also already before I came, I thought, okay, that's an interesting title, but so who, where, where, where is the Hindu? Who can talk about Hinduism? Who is one, one mm. member of a polytheistic uh, religion? Who can explain his own view here? Ah. I mean, because you understand my point? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's more of, a, of an organizational point than <laughs> so I'll hand that back to you. Well, it's a, it's a series specifically um, in the Jewish Islamic Forum where we've invited, uh, uh, and this is the, 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 the fourth or fifth installment of the series, where uh, there's theological perspectives from Judaism and Islam on different topics of science, of human rights, etc. And in this case, we have... Uh, uh, the topic of how do Judaism and Islam see other religions. Um, so it's a, that would be a different kind of event. Um, but thank you. So um, just to go back to your question, when, when uh, this last one, I'll get to your question. When I told my friends that I'm coming to Germany to talk about, uh, have a dialogue in Germany about Islam and Hinduism, they looked at me like I was crazy, saying, I don't understand. When Jews and Muslims get together, they have what to talk about. When Jews go to Germany, they have to talk about. When Jews go to Germany to talk with Muslims, they have what to talk about. And all you have to do is to go to Germany to talk with a Muslim about Hinduism? <laughs> so so, so the, <coughs> the incongruity of it is even greater. Let me just say, I'm not sure you'll really ever find a real polytheist. In other words, I don't know if there are polytheists, if polytheism is a construction of our own understanding. I have yet to find a real polytheist uh, in India or elsewhere. I, 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 there must be because I have to give validity to the notion of idolatry. But uh, other than my needs for that, it's not exactly cl clear to me who understands himself as a polytheist without some kind of a superstructure or infrastructure of unity that informs the polytheism. And when you find him, bring him to me because I need to dissect him and study that further.
Thank you so much. I think we have to, it, it feels like this discussion is the beginning of its own series um, that <laughs> we could continue. Um, our next, um, as, 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 as uh, Rabbi Goshen Gosh, I mentioned, um, there will be uh, an installment about uh, Judaism, Islam, and their view of Buddhism on uh, March 12th. Um, before that, the next event is on February 18, um, about the view of the, the, the two religions on Christianity. Um, and then we will, the next two installments are um, Judaism and Islam looking at atheism. Um, and uh, and uh, the last uh, event in June will be um, the, 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 the uh, Jews and Muslims in interreligious marriages. So that will be its own sort of theological question. Um, I'd like to thank our two, Dr. Kazemi and Professor Goshen Gottstein, so much for coming for this discussion. To the audience, thank you for sticking with us for this long, but it was fascinating and inspiring. Thank you.